So welcome everybody to this introduction to Bitcoin technology. Uh, my name is uh, Maciek. I'm working at Verify, which is a Bitcoin consultancy group uh, based in Montreal. And we also currently developing a non-custodial exchange so we can offer also the service of selling Bitcoin to all Canadians. If that's anything of these services interest to you, you can also contact me directly uh, with the information I'm going to give you later. But today, I just want to do a reminder that this is a part of a three webinar series that the, the goal is to get back to basics and explain Bitcoin uh, technology, Bitcoin economy, and the future of Bitcoin for for a more no fights and people that are just starting to get interested in Bitcoin because we often assume the people that are, that are in Bitcoin for a long time that everybody understands, but Bitcoin is still tr hard to grasp for uh, a lot of people. So this is my attempt to go back uh, to the source and really try to explain it from the, the ground up. So a lot of things today uh, are presented in a really simplified way, just just so people can understand better. Uh, so nothing, not everything is accurately presented, but uh, I just vulgarize it in a way so everybody can understand it. So for those who are more experts here, um, they're gonna maybe see that, but for, for the people that are really new to Bitcoin, I think it's the, the best way to present how Bitcoin works. So today we're not gonna talk about how, why Bitcoin is better money, just to explain all the basics uh, of the technologies behind it. And I hope you will enjoy and learn something today. Hey, and stay tuned for the, 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 the whole presentation because you, you get a chance to win $10 worth of Bitcoin at the end. So um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're here until the end, uh, you're gonna see how to participate in that uh, too. So let us begin. So. What is Bitcoin really? So um, Bitcoin is uh, often presented as like digital money. People think it's uh, kind of related to the stock market, but in the end, Bitcoin is a lot of things. So back to the genesis, Bitcoin was really born out of a dream of some uh, internet people that were called the cypherpunks. And these, this group that, that was really on the verge of uh, certain cultural shifts in the United States where they were looking for a way to express themselves on the internet uh, through code. And uh, one way they, they, one thing they really needed, they think, to, to make that liberty on the internet happen is really a free kind of digital money that is not controlled by any kind of governments. And it was really hard to do in the beginning. And people often think that Bitcoin is the first cryptocurrency but in, uh, the fact is that a lot of tries have been tried before, before Bitcoin and they all failed for one reason or another. And all, all the reasons uh, why Bitcoin was, uh, why uh, these previous cryptocurrencies were failing were uh, mostly resolved in Bitcoin through different technology. So if I could just describe Bitcoin in just one sentence, I will say it's a decentralized, scarce, and censorship resistant digital money and um, and that's that's really that's really it as a as a really way to simplify it but we're going to understand each of these points and why is it decentralized why is it scarce and why is it censorship resistant and the term censorship resistant refers to the fact that if you want to send Bitcoin and uh, to anybody on the planet nobody can really stop you and that is really important when it comes um, the, the fact of considering if something is good money or not. But on that part, we're going to talk more about the economical aspects of it in the next presentation next week. But today, we're just going to talk about the technology. So what really the, the, the biggest problem that, that needed to be solved when creating money on, on the internet is a question of uh, digital scarcity. Because if, for example, you see this kind of text, well, it's really easy to just copy paste any type of information on the internet. And that's that's a problem when creating money because if you have a lot of, if you have some kind of way to multiply a supply of money without any control, well, you can kind of infer that soon enough the, the money is gonna be worth nothing because some some are some people are just gonna abuse of that possibility and 
and devalue the, 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 for example, the Bitcoins or the cryptocurrency he creates on the internet. So as, and I just wanted to illustrate really dumbly how easy it is to just multiply any digital text and see that in fact, you can, you, that's a problem that you needed to solve in the digital world in order to create some kind of money. So one way to do this is to actually say, well, if you, if you want to create a money on the internet, you need some kind of a ledger, a ledger that keeps all the account balances of each of the users that want to use that specific cryptocurrency in order to make sure that all the books are, are, uh, are good and nothing has, uh, nothing has, uh, uh, nobody has input like a wrong entry that creates money for him or that double spends the same cryptocurrency twice. So you make sure everything is accounted for and and uh, rightfully uh, rightfully in the, the the right range of numbers, right? So th this kind of system, right? The ledger already exists in our, our banks uh, today. But the, the the difference between Bitcoin and banks is that bit banks are keeping the ledger for themselves through a really centralized way. And as a user of a bank, you don't have the possibility to verify the ledger of the banks and how they keep their books. And that's kind of a problem because you don't know if they really have the money they pretend to have because ultimately they're just displaying a balance of money that they, that they say they have and that they're keeping for you, but you don't have the, the possibility of verifying that it's true. And one, one thing also is that the banks are the sole uh, all their soul uh, responsible of making entries or making corrections in the ledger. So as a user, you have to ask the permission to the bank in order to send money somewhere else, right? And if the bank doesn't agree with your transaction or they don't agree with your activity, whatever it might be, well, they just can stop your account or either freeze your funds and, and uh, take it out from you. So Bitcoin... Uh, model is really different because um, for the first time in in humans history, everybody in the Bitcoin model has a ledger uh, and has the possibility to verify the supply, verify the transaction that happened on the Bitcoin network. And through that way, you have this kind of a distributed ledger through different parties and everyone and everybody can download this ledger and make sure that all the books are right. So this is the first innovation in terms of Bitcoin's uh, technology because for the first time you have a ledger that is distributed and not centralized through a singular party. So as you can just clearly see here in a, in a bank system, everything is centralized as in Bitcoin, it's more decentralized and you have this network. Everybody is kind of connected to each other because everybody agrees on the same ledger. So there's no need for a third party in order to do transaction or any any type of uh, uh, operation that you will need to do in a Bitcoin in a Bitcoin type situation. So what, now that we have the, the the option of creating a ledger that is going to be distributed for all the users, well, there's also the question of how that ledger will look. And since we're talking about having a digital ledger that has to be updated once in a while uh, in order to make the transaction happen in the, in the network, in the system. Well, maybe you could put that set of transactions, for example, that you wanna uh, aggregate every few minutes and then put them inside a block. And once the block uh, is full, you can then validate the block and pass on to it, uh, pass on the other um, the block the, the block that comes afterwards so that's where the, sh the 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 really the structure of the ledger is really just a data structure in a way and people are going to say that what is really interesting behind bitcoin it's not bitcoin itself but it's more the blockchain but for me uh, like an opinion blockchain is just only the the way that the information is structured inside a network, a cryptocurrency network, and really it's just a chain chain of blocks, right? It's in the name itself. So with that structure, you have, for example, 
few other rules that defines how that blockchain will work. So for example, for Bitcoin, uh, blocks are happening every 10 minutes. So on average, and the block size, which is really how much information you can input in the, inside just a singular block, a block is one megabyte. And of course, all transactions, for example, are also digital text, so they take space. And so the, the, the transactional capacity of Bitcoin will be dependent on um, how much transaction you can input inside a block and then how many blocks are happening on average every 10 minutes. And the beauty with a blockchain is that basically once you have a confirmed block with a set of transactions that happen on a 10 minute time basis, well, when you, once you pass onto, uh, onto another, all the transactions that happened in the first block are now immutable and you can change them. If you, somebody tries to change them and lie to you that this is the right ledger, you're gonna have a really easy way to verify that somebody, somebody is trying to change any type of information. And how, it's, how is it possible is that basically all the blocks are interlinked with like cryptographic signatures. So if you, so all the blockchain has a singular uh, print like s single signatures that could, yeah, that can verify that all the previous information, if it was changed, it will also change the tr the, the the signatures, which make is which makes it really not noticeable that somebody is trying to uh, to play with it. So this is so now we have another set of rules that I just talked about uh, inside what is for Bitcoin and. So we have the distributed ledger concept, and we also have the fact that the the ledger itself is in the forms of, is a, in the form of a blockchain. So you next uh, the next question will be when w once we have that ledger distributed ledger in a form of blockchain, uh, we need to update the blockchain every ten minutes on average according to the rules of Bitcoin. So somebody has to input these changes, these transactions inside and has to validate them. But the thing is, how do we give this privilege to anybody to make these kind of uh, these kind of entries to the ledger? Because it's a kind of a big power to having the right to validate a set of transaction inside a system like that. So who do you attribute the right, the privilege to do so? And in fact, because Bitcoin is decentralized, you wouldn't want like a centralized party that gives the authority to uh, to someone to sign to sign the ledger as as valid, uh, like you will do in a bank, right? So only your bank clerk can you can do, initiate a transaction or or uh, or um, so it's really centralized. But in Bitcoin, you can't do that because there's no central party. Everybody has a copy of the ledger. So in fact. There is no privilege. Anybody can propose changes to, led, to the ledger. But how do you choose them? Because now you have the possibility for everyone to write changes. So I'm going to explain that in a second and bring another concept that is really important in Bitcoin, which are miners and that you probably heard about. So imagine already embryonic uh, network, Bitcoin network, which only three users. You have Bob, Leo, Leo and Alice. And in a in a ten minutes time frame, one of them decides that well, the Leo decides that he wants to send 0.5 Bitcoin to Alice, and um, Alice decides that she wants to send 0.2 Bitcoin to Bob. So while that is happening, these transactions are put on hold and put inside a specific space that is called the mempool and they are awaiting before to be included in the block. And during that time, the same time, 10 minutes time frame, there are the, there's the miners. So I'm gonna explain in a second why the miners in details. So basically miners are the one that have the rights to input entries to the ledger. And the only way one of these miners, these three miners can have the right uh, to write any type, uh, to include a new block to the Bitcoin blockchain is to actually win a kind of lottery. So I'm going to explain that analogy in a second because if now you're like, okay, there's a lottery involved in Bitcoin, that's kind of weird. Well, that's kind of the only way we can find 
that is fair in order to be to, give, to be giving the rights to write entries to the ledger because if you can choose somewhat somebody based on the fact that it's uh, it could be like a permission from somebody else well you have to make it random uh, for anybody that wants to join and include a block that's why um, the process that miners are going through are really comparable to a lottery and you're gonna see why so a lot of we, uh, it's kind of a, an analogy to the proof of work, the, the thing that the Bitcoins are doing. So the concept here is that basically you don't want uh, the miners spamming the, the network with all, always new blocks. So the only way a miner can propose a block is to respond to a question, a mathematical problem. And that problem can only be resolved by, tr uh, by trial and error. So you, if you create that kind of system, you make sure that all the people participating in that math problem in order to have the, the privilege, well, the, 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 the possibility of writing a new block into, Bitcoin, in, into Bitcoin's blockchain is by making them play a lottery. So I illustrated like the, in some kind of way what the miners are doing, but of course they're not really doing that but it's just as a way to understand so imagine there's two miners in the bitcoin network right now and the problem that is proposed to them is that they have each one of them has a 10 sided dice and they have to obtain one into uh, in order to have the right uh, um, the right answer and the rights to have uh, the rights to in the to write a new entry into the the bitcoin uh, bitcoin's blockchain and a miner tries um to to guess that the, he has the capacity to do that every two minutes one try every minute so when the lottery is starting while well, all of uh, the two miners are are uh, you know uh, are launching the dice and both of them gets uh, are getting the wrong answer they get three and in, on the second guess uh they still get a, a wrong answer and now you st you still have to remember that uh on average, a block is resolved in Bitcoin every 10 minutes. And so what just happened here, you have two tries. And since they try, the, the miners are trying every two minutes, four minutes have, have just passed. So on average, if we follow that logic, um, it's only on the fifth try that one of the miners will find the right answer and uh, could validate the block and include it as in the next block in the Bitcoin blockchain. So, so that process is kind of explained that way and that's really proof of work because a miner that, that does these calculations uh, can prove that he tried several times before getting the right answer and it's really easy once he get it to just pass to on the next block and everybody just say, okay, this miner has one, he has the right response and we, we just move on to the next block and we, we start it all over again. But then imagine uh, what is basically happening all the time in Bitcoin is people are getting interested. So everyone, everyone, everybody wanna play in the lottery. So in the next round, after the first block is resol uh, resolved, uh, sorry for the mistakes here. It's uh, minors, not minor. And and then uh, the next block, you have two more miners. So what is happening? You remember that the set ten second rule. So in average, if these four miners try and they have the same capacity in, in when it comes to trying uh, to roll the dice. So on the first, on the first. Uh, on the first try here, they all get the wrong answer too, but on average, they should get the answer after two, three tries because there's two times more miners now. So there's two times more tries that are being tried. And since it's a 10, since there is a chance of one, uh, like a 10% chance to get the right answer, you should get the right answer at least on the, uh, uh, on the third try. And so what does that mean is because since there's more miners right now, uh, the answer is gonna be found more ra uh, rapidly and faster. So 
something needs to be changed in order to always bring back the the average uh, closure of a block every 10 minutes. So basically, what is also included into in, in the Bitcoin rules is the fact that there's an adjustment when it comes to, uh, uh, with the difficulty of the math mathematical problem that is being proposed to the miners. So for example, in order to adjust the difficulty here and bring back the 10 minute uh, average time span of a block, well, instead of having, having a 10 sided dice, we make it four times uh, uh, we, we we double the we we double the 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 number of sides on the dice. So when the miners are 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 launching their dice, there's less chance to get the right answer. And that process of readjustment happens every two weeks in Bitcoin, and has been going on ever since. So at the beginning, when the mine miners were beginning to mine Bitcoin, they were mining with only regular computers such as. Uh, such as laptops and everybody, because there were all, there were much less miners in the uh, in the process. But as the years went by and people were getting more and more interested in Bitcoin, they created more specialized computer. So if we get back to the analogy of of launching the dice, well, um, you be, uh, you basically uh, instead of having, for example, miner that does a try every two minutes. He has the ability to create five tries in a minute. So all the time you have to adjust the difficulty of the problem in order to make sure that the answer is always found around a 10 minute time span. So that, that's all I mentioned here are basically rules of Bitcoin that are included into, into the protocol. And that's how the process of finding a new valid block happens every 10 minutes. So just just uh, as a way to illustrate, uh, it, well, basically, of course, the miners are not uh, are, are not playing with dice. What is happening behind the scenes are are basically hashes. So a hash is basically a way to say uh, is a is basically an algorithm that transforms a certain set of information that is uh, that is the input information into a cryptographic signature. So instead of uh, playing with dices, the miners are basically trying different hashes in order to compare it to the, the, the answer that is being proposed um, the, by the network randomly. And that answer, the right technical term uh, in Bitcoin is called the nouns. And the specific hashing algorithm is a SHA-256. So since this is a more beginner's presentation, I didn't want it. I didn't want to like dwell into it. So that's why I presented it as a as a dice launching game. But that is that they're not doing this. They're basically playing with hashes like that. And just to illustrate how much the Bitcoin network proof of work has grown during all these years. Well, basically now you have that much hashes per second. So imagine. Basically, that are the numbers of tries or roll roll dices that happen every ten seconds, and if we take the current hash rate and divide it by the most popular, I will say, computer to mine Bitcoin, which is the S9, uh, which which has the capacity to create fourteen trillion hashes per second. Well, you you can arrive at the conclusion that there's around ten million S9s at the moment playing that game in, in Bitcoin and basically protecting the network because nobody can try and nobody can uh, can propose a block to the to the blockchain without ha without passing through that process first. So if somebody wants to recreate some of the blocks, he will have to redo all the proof of work, all the tries that were tried by the previous miners in order to uh, in, inscribe a new entry to the ledger. And since this is evolving more and more, this is going to be even more difficult in the future. So why, why, why are miners doing this, basically? Why are they spending all that money on equipment, on, uh, on, different, uh, on energy, and uh, doing all these uh, lottery uh, for nothing, maybe? Well, no. Well, since there's a question of a proof of work here, well, when you work, you, you're getting paid, right? So 
because they're doing a service to the Bitcoin network, miners are getting uh, compensated uh, through a subsidy, a subsidy that that is also coming directly from the protocol. So at when a miner finds the right response, the right answer to the, the mathematical problem, he can include the the block the block the valid block that he just find found the answer for, and he gets rewarded uh, for the work he has done, and uh, directly through the protocol. So when it started, um, when Bitcoin started, that the 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 subsidy was around fifty bitcoins per ten every ten minutes, and um, and at the time fifty bitcoins right now look is really. Uh, a big amount of money, especially that they're getting distributed every 10 minutes. But at the time, Bitcoin had no value at all. So it was really more like a, you know, an experiment between uh, between geeks and people that, are, that were fans, cypherpunks and everything. And, but since the, since the process is advancing and people have uh, adopted Bitcoin in the longer term. What has been also included in, as a role in the uh, in, uh, in the Bitcoin protocol is that every um, 210,000 10, blocks, there is uh, something that is called a halvening, which reduces by half the the amount of Bitcoin that miners are receiving every 10 minutes. And so that pro through that process, you can understand that basically that's how. You get the, the the famous rules of 21 million bitcoins. That so so the it the sorry <laughs> so every four years you have a reduction of that. So uh, for example, right now we are the fourth epoch of Bitcoin because we already went through three halvings. So right now the miners are receiving 6.25 bitcoins every 10 minutes, and the, the last Bitcoin is going to be mined in 2140. So so it's basically in a really long time. But since you receive a lot of, of the Bitcoins in the beginning of, uh, of its lifetime, uh, right now we're here in 2020, there's already 18 something million uh, Bitcoins that are already produced and there's only 3 million left to mine. So there's a big rush in that regard. So a lot of people are still... Um, uh, still, uh, still mining a lot, and as we have seen in the previous slides, we actually just have reached a new all-time high when it comes to the ha the hash rate per second uh, recently. So people are still wanting to get that three millions left. So that's how you also get the twenty-one million rule, right? And that's that's another really important uh, factor why Bitcoin is attractive when it comes to investment is that it's really rare and basically nobody has the the a way to change any of that rules uh, any of these rules so back to the blockchain as previously mentioned for example i just shown a really basic structure of what a blockchain is but right now we can include two more information inside of course there's a lot more inside the block uh, that is more complicated, but you have the nouns, which is the answer to the problem, and also the the Coinbase transaction, which is the name, not not the exchange, because there's a really famous exchange called Coinbase. Uh, probably most of most of you uh, heard about it at least. But you also have a Coinbase transaction, which is the transaction that the miners are paying to themselves. The the miner, the right miner that answer the right nouns, he has the right to ins to write a new entry into the Bitcoin uh, the Bitcoin ledger that attribute a certain amount of Bitcoin to himself. So, of course, since we're the, the blocks here, uh, uh, we're at the beginning of, uh, of Bitcoin history, it's only 400 blocks. Uh, that's why here you have a coin based transaction of 50 Bitcoins as as I said previously before, but if you go to if you if you go verify a block today, you will see that Coinbase transaction are always six point twenty five bitcoins according uh, to all the halvings that happen. So you have all these information inside of blockchain, and that's how basically you get all these new blocks getting added added uh, all the time is because the miners are validating them. So. So that's that's one thing, but 
one thing that must be clear when somebody wants to understand the process of miners is that miners are not at all treating uh, the transaction. They are not validating the transaction. They don't have any uh, any way to verify if they're valid. And the only thing basically they're doing is validating the blocks. They're not validating the transaction. Of course, they validate the block in which there are transactions, but there's a difference uh, to be made here and you're gonna understand why. So you, maybe you have remarked that basically all I, I'll talk to the all I, I was talk uh, all I was talking today was were basically all rules. So you have the twenty one million rule. You have the 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 difficulty adjustment rules happening uh, every two weeks. You have the size of the blocks. You have the the ten minute average time span of uh, between each blocks. You have the SHA two fifty six the hashing algorithm rule. So you, you, you have all these rules that make Bitcoin basically, and you, what is Bitcoin basically is a, is a set of people, a set of users agree, agreeing to partake in some kind of businesses or transaction by following all the same rules. So that's, that's really a protocol. So you yourself as a Bitcoin regular user, uh, you might, want to have the power to audit uh, anything that happened in the bitcoin uh, in the bitcoin network and that and you want to make sure that everybody follows the protocol rules so you don't get screwed so for example if somebody tries to spend bitcoin twice well you want to have the possibility of verifying that something like that happened and you may not want to use bitcoin anymore if you see that some rules are not respected and you also have the concept that basically Miners, even if they, they are a pretty powerful group, uh, a set of uh, participants in the Bitcoin network because they get all this money by simply in, uh, including new blocks uh, uh, onto the, the Bitcoin's blockchain. So you need uh, some kind of balance in that network in order to make it work because you have all these corporate miners that are, that are, that are really powerful and they they have that, that chance of, of making money by only plugging computers to the, to, the, to the electricity. So you need some kind of balance. So that balance is brought by Bitcoin full nodes. And this is a concept that is often missed in beginner's presentation, but I, I think that it's really important and it's actually more understandable and more simple than the mining process because as you as you could see it took me like 30 minutes to explain uh, the mining process but i could in reality you could talk about it uh, much more and that's that's the thing that often people are missing is that the miners are not treating the transaction the transaction are validated by bitcoin full nodes and how they, they do so is that basically all Bitcoin full nodes, they are the one keeping the ledger. You remember at the beginning, I said you need a system in which you have a distributed ledger in order to have a, a digital money that could work on the internet. Well, basically the, the, the ledger is, is really uh, some information that, that is kept by some users that want to run a Bitcoin full node. And these Bitcoin full nodes are really the people are interconnected between themselves, forming the Bitcoin network. So when we say Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer technology, well, what well a peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency? What we are talking about as a peer is is really the Bitcoin full nodes, and the difference between a Bitcoin full nodes in terms of the costs and the requirements in terms of hardware and uh, and everything are really low. So you can basically run a Bitcoin full node on on a, on a Raspberry Pi or microcomputer. As of for miners, you really need specific computers that can only do this. So it's really a specific endeavor that they will take if you want to mine Bitcoin in the Bitcoin network. But if you just want to hold the, the, the blockchain by yourself and validate it solely and sovereignly through the software that is also included in the Bitcoin full node, well, 
you, you're a completely independent user and your own auditor of the Bitcoin's blockchain. Because what is happening when you download the Bitcoin full node, the, the node is going to ask information around uh, in the network from other participants, from other users, and they're going to feed them the blockchain blockchain's data. But because the blockchain's data can is all cryptographically linked, you can verify its validity since the beginning by yourself. So you have this balance of power that is constantly happening in Bitcoin, and that, that makes sure that you have a set of users that have the possibility to, to very audit Bitcoin in a really cheap way. And because of that, you have a really nice system in, in which you have the miners providing the security for the network so nobody can just write entries and, and tries to spam the network. But on the other side, Bitcoin full nodes are making sure that all the transactions that are being included inside a block are valid and you have a decentralized system. So just, just as a proof that Bitcoin is, all, is really hard to kill in, in some kind of sense, because uh, these kinds of nodes, uh, I showed you previously, there's a, a lot of them um, uh, running a, around the world. And basically it's far more, there's far more Bitcoin full nodes than, than any other type of cryptocurrency. Most of other crypto, cryptocurrency have uh, really few uh, full nodes that validate the whole ledger. And that's why Bitcoin is way more decentralized than any other crypto. So just as an, uh, just uh, just wanted to show you quickly the map because it's kind of fun to see where everybody is running the nodes. So you have, a, we can go see in Montreal that there is quite a few. And the beauty behind this, now you see now uh, they're saying that there's around 10,100 uh, nodes, but in reality, there's way more than this because these are only the public nodes. So basically the people signaling they have, they have a Bitcoin full node. But in reality, there's a uh, ways to run nodes through the through Tor, for example, which is a onion based uh, network that is much more private and a lot of these nodes, Bitcoin full nodes are happening uh, on hybrid networks. So there's even more Bitcoins um, than presented here. Uh, th there's even more Bitcoin full nodes than presented here. And that's why if you wanted to kill Bitcoin, you will need to destroy every copy of the ledger, right? Because then uh, the history of Bitcoin will be for forgotten. Nobody has so, but that's basically virtually impossible because you will have to go in everyone's home here, present it here, and take out their their their, their Raspberry Pi and crush it on the floor and uh, wipe their hard disk space. So, just you know, it's you could do it, but good luck. It's pra practically impossible, and then you will have to find the people. Uh, hiding on, on Tor, for example, and do the same thing. So that's almost impossible. So today, really, I talk about how Bitcoin works. Uh, I didn't went into uh, anything that ha has uh, a link to wallets, and because I think that's a subject on its own uh, with a lot of things to talk about. And I, in another series, previous series I did a month ago. Uh, I did a intro. I did a basically a full month uh, with security webinars, talking talking specifically which wallets to use, how wallets work. So at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna put a link. So if you wanna start with that, you can also uh, go look into how to choose the right Bitcoin wallet. But I just wanted to mention quickly here. So you remember you have the Bitcoin network here which are all the, the Bitcoin full nodes interconnected. And basically um, when your wallet is interacting and creating a transaction, he will always have to pass through a first a, a server, a Bitcoin full node that will communicate this information to the rest of the network so that transaction can be eventually put inside a valid block. And then you have uh, either you're receiving Bitcoins or you're sending Bitcoins to somebody else everything, every information has to pass through that first survey. And 
not every not a lot of users are using Bitcoin full nodes because it's it's kind of for geeks, you know, and people that are caring about the fact that they don't want to have any third parties uh, when they're using Bitcoin. And that's fine if in the beginning you don't use one because it, it takes quite of a, a, a thought process before getting into the importance of that. But it's just as a fact to illustrate how your wallet interacts with the Bitcoin network is basically is just computers com communicating between themselves. And so that's all you have to understand really to understand Bitcoin. It's just a network with a set of rules and all that network agrees on a set of rules. And that's how Bitcoin becomes money because that's how, that's how uh, people, uh, people are thinking about that specific information that is traveling to the network. So, uh, if you have any questions, it's going to be soon the time. But as promised, uh, so th this is a or a, or a, a try to really trying to stimulate uh, more people to learn about Bitcoin. So what we wanted to do with this kind of presentation is uh, basically help people, but also get new people in into Bitcoin because we believe it might be really helpful for some for some people in the coming years. So as promised, there is a ten dollars worth of Bitcoin that is uh, that is going to be uh, 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 going through a lottery between all the people participating here. So basically, what you can do is to participate is just to go on the Verify's page on Facebook, follow and like. And I just uh, the I just did a post about the the, the webinar today. And what I would like to, you to do is to basically like the latest post too, and just leave a comment if you like the presentation or, uh, or either write something that you liked, uh, that, that you learned today and invite five friends and everybody that is in the comments uh, and that has done that, uh, I will do a lottery between these people and send them $10 worth of Bitcoin uh, tomorrow when uh, when when uh, all the participants have the, the chance to try so don't hesitate to go and participate ten dollars worth of bitcoin today might be worth much more in the future so thank you very much so as a quick reminder i just want to say that this is the first presentation out of three uh coming uh in the coming weeks so today we talk about bitcoin technology and the next week, I'm going to go more on the uh, econ economical aspects of it, monetary aspects of it, and do the, the comparisons with today's uh, bank system and uh, how the world works today with our fiat money and all these things. And on the 3rd of September, I'm going to talk more about how Bitcoin is evolving, uh, what, what, what can people expect from Bitcoin's future. And so... I will be happy if you come back or bring new people. So I'm, uh, I'm basically open for questions now. And for those who want to participate, participate in, in, uh, in uh, sorry, in order to win the $10 worth of Bitcoin, you can go on the page here. And as I mentioned before, in, in regards of the, the, the wallets, and all the, the questions about security, for example, if you want to get started into Bitcoin and uh, don't know exactly how, uh, that's that's the things we do at Verify. We help people to get into it. We also have an exchange, as mentioned, in order to buy Bitcoin through a non-custodial way, which means that the Bitcoin are never held on our platform. They're directly sent to you. So anything that you want to learn you can go on the youtube uh, youtube channel to learn about all these things and if you have any questions i i've written everything in the chat you can send a message directly to me and it will be a pleasure for me to to talk with you and uh and uh, meet new bitcoiners and see how we can help you so if there's a if there's any question you can either write them in the chat or just talk don't be shy and uh, just ask any questions you want. Yeah. 
where I is so clear that there's no question. Yeah, so the event's gonna be posted uh, today. Sorry about that. It's gonna be on the uh, Bitcoin Montreal Meetup group. Uh, I can send that as well, just to make sure for everybody. But you know, everybody has uh, has come that way. So everything's gonna be posted today here. I'm just curious, is it, for, for those who are here, is it the first time that you assist? Uh... So, uh, somebody here, uh, sorry, I don't want to pronounce your name to not, uh, not cannibalize it. Uh, so what do you mean exactly by how do you start learning blockchain practically? Um, I don't, that question be, could be answered through different ways. And uh, thank you, Jerome, for, uh, for assisting. So J Jerome, uh, Well, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I'm so sorry. Well, if you want to learn about Bitcoin, and there's a difference, I think, when it comes to learning about blockchain or uh, or Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is kind of the, the, the number one thing in the oldest, so it may not look as... Uh, as uh, exciting as Bitcoin, uh, as blockchain technology and everything. So my advice will be that if you wanna delve into that space, you should learn more about Bitcoin than blockchain. So I don't have any specific uh, things to recommend when it comes to blockchain. But if you want to learn about, uh, about Bitcoin, uh, I can put some re resources here in the chat uh just just so you can have a good head start and of course if you wanna if you go on our blog for example you also have a lot of content about bitcoin uh, with different uh, with different approaches uh, on the technological side on the economical side but if you start for example by loop loop resources is really great if not, people are often recommending Andreas Antonopoulos as a learning resource for blockchain. So you can look into that as well if you want. And Jérôme, uh, I just want to quick mention that it's preferable not to keep uh, Bitcoin on Coinbase because, for example, they're, they're a centralized party and basically they are the, the owner they're the real owner of uh, your Bitcoins. So it'll be my pleasure to talk with you and just to give you um, quick uh, tips or, uh, or ways to, to keep the Bitcoin yourself so you can be more sovereign. So don't hesitate to just contact me in a, any kind of way. What, either on the ledger or, or even desktop wallets as you want. There's a different way to approach this. So I think uh, nobody has school. Perfect. So as I said, just send me a message here and uh, we have a chat, friendly chat. So if there's no more question, is there, if there's no more question, I will uh, finish the presentation here. I, every, I, uh, I hope that everybody learned something and uh, uh, don't, uh, don't forget the, the, the chance to get $10 worth of Bitcoin just by following and liking a page. So, uh, and that also helps us to, 
to reach more people. So uh, thank you very much for those who, who, who were there. And I hope to see you also next week. So thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.